Church, please turn with me in God's Word to the book of Exodus, chapter 15. We continue in the book of Exodus this morning. And um, I don't normally ask for participation from the congregation, but I have a genuine question. There's not a right or wrong answer here. I just want to know what your experience uh, has been before uh, in church and around uh, church people. I'm not asking you what you believe you ought to have heard, but I want to know what you've heard more your whole, li- whole life. One of either of two statements, that God is love or that God is holy. Which of those have you heard said more throughout your life? If you've heard that God is love more, would you raise your hand? Okay. If you've heard that God is holy more, would you raise your hand? So just a few. In the Bible, we are told in one place, 1 John chapter 5, verse 8, that God is love, and that is true. In the Bible, we are told in more than 600 places that God is holy. And yet, 95% of us have heard the statement that God is love more than God is holy. They're both true, but why this neglect of the holiness of God? What does it mean that God is holy? It means that God is unique, set apart, different than anyone or anything else in all of existence. God is sinless. God is perfect. God is good. He is the very definition and standard of what is good and right and true. God is holy because there is no one like Him. The title of the sermon this morning comes from the text, Who is like the Lord? Which is a question that points out the holiness of God. The answer is, no one is like the Lord, and that's what it means that He is holy. He's not like this fallen, messed up, sinful, wicked world. He is good, perfect, true, righteous. No one is like Him. And it really is a a mistake, nay, a neglect of duty, that in churches today, people hear that God is love all the time, and they should hear that God is love, but they don't hear that God is holy. Furthermore, when we talk about God being love, some people think God is love means that God is like an ishy, squishy teddy bear, that, that He would never hurt a fly. But that's not the biblical picture of God. By the way, love means to put someone before yourself. To do what is good for them rather than what is easy for you. Love means to make a sacrifice for another person, right? Love is defined upon the cross, John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this than that he laid down his life for his friend. And Jesus laid down his life for us on the cross. We're told in Ephesians 5.25 that husbands should love their wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You see, love is about sacrifice. Love is is about putting other people before yourself. Love is not a feeling. Love is a commitment to care for another person, to, to give up your life for them. So, yes, God is love, but that means that God cares about us so much that He sent His own Son, Jesus, to live the perfect sinless life that we have not lived, to die upon the cross, to pay for our sins, that He's coming again to redeem us from our sin. And we have brought all these things upon ourselves, and yet God in His mercy and His kindness and His goodness has sacrificed His own Son so that we could be made righteous. And this is all for His glory and His praise. And we are here today to worship Him on the Lord's Day because this day is about praising and thanking Him for what He's done. That's what it means that God is love. Next, the more common biblical emphasis, 600 times more emphasized, God is holy. R.C. Sproul has pointed out, he is now going to be with the Lord, but he had pointed out that You don't find any places in the Bible that say God is love, love, love. 
There's only one attribute of God that is repeated three times in a row. God is holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. And we're told in Revelation chapter 5 that we will sing that forever in heaven. Now why is it repeated three times? Because in the Hebrew language, where this appears in Isaiah chapter 6, if you really want to emphasize something, you would say it twice. If you said the word twice in a row, you were, were really emphasizing it. But to say it three times in a row? I mean, that's not done often in Hebrew, but to do that is to give the greatest possible emphasis that you can in that language. To say God is holy, holy, holy is to say this is the most important thing about Him. This this is the main thing about God. He is unique, set apart, different from anyone or anything else in all of creation. God is holy. It is His primary and most essential attribute. If you know anything about God, you need to know that He is holy. And the sad thing is, is that many people who've grown up in churches today don't even know what it means that God is holy. The single most important thing that the Bible tells us about God, and we miss that thing. So let's get back to the Word of God. And see how the Bible defines God's holiness here in Exodus chapter 15. This is one of hundreds of passages that focus upon the holiness of God in Scripture. This is, by the way, probably the first passage of Scripture that Moses ever wrote. Because we are told that it was written right after they crossed the Red Sea. Moses wrote Genesis through Deuteronomy. And so chapter 15, after they crossed the Red Sea, this was probably written first and then later when the entire Pentateuch, the book of the five, the Genesis to Deuteronomy were written by Moses, he would have included this in, but he probably wrote this hymn that we're about to read in Exodus 15 first. You might say, well, is that the first part of the Bible to be written? No, that almost certainly was the book of Job. But this would have been the second part of the Bible to be written. And we read in Exodus 15, verse 1, then Moses... And the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider He has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name. Stopping there after verse 3. Remember, the people have just crossed the sea. They have watched the Egyptian chariots and army drown in the sea. Their bodies are washing up on the seashore as they stand there on the other side of the Red Sea with all of their enemies dead, floating in the water in front of them. And Moses and the people of Israel, who would have been a few million people, by the way, standing there on the the eastern shore of the Red Sea, having crossed over by the miracle of God in parting the sea and then causing it to collapse in on the Egyptian army and destroy them. They watched all this happen And then they stopped. And rather than keep going and figure out what we're going to feed the kids, or, you know, do we have all of our supplies? Did we leave anything back there in the sea? Because we're not going to get it back now. They, They didn't do that before they did. And I'm sure they did that later. But the first thing they did was stop and praise God. They they, they paused and said, Look, before we go any further, can we just stop and say, Thank you, God? for your wonder, for your mercy toward us, for your goodness to us. So they stopped and they sang this song to the Lord. And this is the song they sang. First, I will sing to the Lord. It's an intentional act. They stopped and they said, before we do anything else, we need to sing to the Lord. Why? Because He has triumphed gloriously. Notice in this hymn, it's all about what God has done. Nothing about what we've done. 
Listen to much Christian music today, especially that is playing on popular Christian radio. You will hear more me, 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 I, I, I than thee and thou. I'll tell you that much. Or you, God. Not using the older thee and thou, but to, to speak of God and what He's done, it's, it's mostly about me and how I feel and what I want and what God's done for me. And there is some truth in that. Don't misunderstand me. But it seems that so often the focus becomes me rather than God. If you read in our hymnal, look at those songs. Great is thy faithfulness. There's a focus upon God and who He is and what He's done. I'm not saying that new songs are bad, but I am saying that songs that focus more upon me rather than upon God, those are bad. And so if we're going to write new songs, let's write them well. Let's write them from a biblical perspective. Let's make it look like this. For He has triumphed gloriously. That's why I'm singing for what He's done. The horse and the rider He has thrown into the sea. And then look at verse 2. It's not, I'm strong, I can do it. In so many churches today, it's as if the preacher gets up and he gives a big pep talk. You're a, you're a conqueror. You're, you're a king. Boy, you can do this. You're, you're strong enough. But that's not what Scripture emphasizes, is it? The Bible tells us we are weak. We can do nothing without Christ. That, that if we do not abide in Him, we'll be cut off and thrown into the fire. Apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus says in John 15. So it says here in Exodus 15, verse 2, The Lord is my strength. Not that I am strong, but He is strong and He is enough for me. He'll provide everything I need. I'm just going to trust in Him. That is the biblical focus. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God. And because of all these things that He is, I will praise Him. My Father's God. And I will exalt Him. Worship is all about exalting God. Not me, not you. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One of the things we've been discussing on Wednesday and Sunday evenings as we read through the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith together as a church is we are looking now in chapter 22 upon worship on the, on the Lord's Day. And one of the things that we see emphasized by um, those, those uh, forefathers, the, the early Baptists in the late 1600s, one of the things that they emphasize there that is, that is so wise is they talk about how worship is to be about what God requires of us. We are to worship according to how God wants us to worship, and we should not first consider how people want us to worship. Now we hear so often in churches today, well, you need to do this because young people like that. If you don't have this, these people won't come. You ever heard people talk like that about church? you got to have this if you want to get them to come. Well, if we don't do that, we'll never get them. Yes, the Holy Spirit of God is incapable of saving people if we don't help Him out by, you know, adding something to the stage. The gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit of God who can part the Red Sea can't get young people in church if we just preach His Word and sing His praises and seek His face in prayer. Is that what we really believe? Worship is about exalting God in verse 2. I will exalt Him. It's not about me. So often people come and go from churches, well, I want this. Well, I want that. Well, I'm not getting enough of this. I'm not getting enough of that. This is what I need. How often do we stop and say, you know why I'm a, I'm a part of this church? Because this is where God wants me. This is where God is glorified. This is where God's Word is truly taught and proclaimed and shared and we fellowship according to His Word. I would encourage you to be a part of a church and to live your daily life thinking about what does God want from me? Not what do I expect from Him or other people. If we could exalt God rather than ourselves, that would go a long way in our walk with Christ and growing into mature Christians. Moses says, I will praise 
God. I will focus upon Him, who He is, what He's done, and what He requires of me. Verse 3, look at this description of God. I've never seen this on a coffee cup, by the way. So look, if you want to know a good Christmas present for me, etch this on a coffee cup. The Lord is a man of war. Amen. I like that. What does that mean? That God will destroy His enemies. Brothers and sisters, part of God being holy means He cannot tolerate sin. In Psalm chapter 7, if a man does not repent, the Lord will destroy him. If a man does not repent, the Lord has wet his sword. His bow is pulled back to pierce the heart of the wicked. That is what Scripture says about the one who makes himself God's enemy and refuses to bow the knee to the Lord. The Lord is a man of war. Why should you fear God? Because if you don't bow to Him, He will destroy you. Hell's a real place. It's not just some idea or some image. It's what each of us deserve. It's the reason that Jesus' death upon the cross was required to save us. Because we deserve God's wrath. And Jesus took it upon the cross in our place. The Lord is a man of war. And I'll tell you one thing about a man of war. He's not a sissy. He's a man of war. He's not playing games. He calls each of us to obey Him and serve Him. And if we don't bow the knee to Him, He will make us bow the knee in judgment on the last day. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord, Yahweh, is His name. Verse 4. Now let's look at God's enemies and see what happens to them. Verse 4 says, Pharaoh's chariots and his host, all of his army, he, the Lord, cast into the sea. And his chosen officers, oh, his best military men, they were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths of the sea like a stone. Oh, you know your soldiers you so, you're so proud of, Pharaoh? Yeah, I made them sink like a rock in a, in a sea. They're gone. Never to be seen or heard from again. Verse 6, Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. You ever set fire to a dry bed of pine straw? Just whoo! It's, it's, it's almost as flammable as gasoline. It's incredible. Stubble is like that. It's... It so quickly burns with such great intensity. And that's what happens when God's enemies try to stand before Him. He consumes them like stubble. Verse 8. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. It's just the idea that God can breathe and He's so powerful that his, his, as He exhales, it parts the sea. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. God literally parted the Red Sea. It's not a metaphor. It's it's not something the Hebrews came up with later. It literally miraculously happened. The Red Sea parted. We are told that the, 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 the floods stood up in a heap, great walls of water on each side as they passed through. Verse 9, the enemy seeing this said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its own fill of them. I will draw the sword. My hand will destroy them. Did you notice what happened in the language there? We went from the third person in talking about God and what He has done to the first person. I, 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 and who speaks like that? God's enemies. 
This is what God's enemy says, verse 9. I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire, I will draw the sword, my hand shall destroy them. You see, that's what self-centered people do. These are God's enemies. They're focused upon I, me, and my. But verse 10, you blew with your wind and the sea covered them. God just blew them down. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. This is what God does with the plans of His enemies. He absolutely destroys them. This is why we shouldn't trust in ourselves, because this is where we will end up at the bottom of the sea, sinking like a stone or lead. God is sovereign. He is in control. He will conquer His enemies. You don't want to be His enemy. You want to be His child. You want to trust Him. You want to know Him. Now, this, this hymn is what's called in Hebrew a chiasm. It's the beginning and the end mirror one another, and it's, uh, it all runs together. And the middle section, the middle verse, is the whole point. That's how a chiasm works. It's, it's all pointing to the middle, and that's verse 11. So if you want to know what it's all about, read verse 11. That's why I entitled the sermon after it. Because the way the Hebrew text is written, it all points to verse 11. This is the main point of the passage. The question is asked, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? You think of Egypt's gods. What good did they do? Exactly. (laughs) None. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? The whole point is this, that you would realize who God is, that He's totally unique, separate from everyone and everything else in all of creation, and that you would realize His awesomeness in His glorious deeds, that He is majestic in His holiness. And if you would understand who He is and how great He is, then you would never want to live for the things of this world. Why would you trade the one who is worth more than silver and gold and all the wealth and all the power and all the world. Why would, you, why would you give away Christ? Eternal life in Him. Living for Jesus. Why would you give that away? For that which is worthless. You see, if you understood who God is and His greatness and His glory, then you would make up your mind, I'm following Him because nothing else is worth the pursuit of my life. Why would I live my life for anyone or anything else when I know the greatest one who is above all else and made everything else? That's the whole point. The Egyptians didn't understand, but the Israelites saw God's glory. And proclaimed it. Now, once again, verses 12 to 18 kind of repeat what came before it in verses 2 to 10. So we'll cover this quickly because really, in descending order, it it mirrors the verses that came before it in verses 2 to 10. This is what it says Verse 12 You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You led in your steadfast love the people whom you've redeemed. You guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard, they tremble, pangs have seized the inhabitants of uh, Philistia. Now the chiefs, now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed, trembling seizes the leaders of Moab, and all the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Why is he mentioning these other peoples, the Philistines, the Edomites, the Moabites, the Canaanites? Why does he mention them? Because those are the people who live in the land that they are going to take in Israel. Those are the current inhabitants of Israel. And they heard about how God destroyed the army of Pharaoh in the sea. And they heard that Israel is headed to take their land. And they are trembling because they realize how powerful God is. Even unbelievers, terrified, having heard what God done to the army of Egypt. 
Verse 16, terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone till your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. This will never change. God will never falter. He will never fail. This will always be true. Then in verses 19 to 21, we get a summary in verse 19 of what's happened. It says, For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked through on dry ground in the midst of the sea. And with those words, it kind of closes this section of the book. We're not going to hear anything else about Egypt. They're done. They're at the bottom of the sea. Verse 20. Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, who would also be the sister of Moses, but Aaron was the older brother, so that's probably why it says the sister of Aaron and not Moses. Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed glorious the horse, and His rider He has thrown into the sea. Which of course is just a quote of the second half of verse 1, which is to say that Miriam taught the women in Israel the song that Moses wrote in verses 1 to 18. Now some people make a big deal out of this. Miriam is called a prophetess, and so that means that somehow we should have women pastors in the church today because Miriam is called a prophetess. Why is she called that? Because she taught the women in Israel the song that Moses wrote. If, if someone wants to try to extrapolate that into, therefore we should have women pastors today, I just want to say, you, if you twist the Bible hard enough, you can make it say almost anything. All this is showing is that Miriam was a woman who was a great example to other women in Israel and she taught the song that Moses wrote to the women in Israel. And they praised God. And they worshipped Him. Because no one is like Him. And He is worthy of our praise. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Lord, as we examine our hearts this morning, I, I pray that You would cause us to repent of every sin, that we would turn to You, Lord, that we would consider our need of You, that we would confess our sin, we would truly repent from the heart, that Christ would be glorified. Lord, I pray for those who may be here today who have never bowed the knee to Christ. God, I pray that You would grant them the gift of faith and even now they would come and make known their desire to follow Christ. Lord, lead in our hearts this morning as we respond to Your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.